So let's talk about nonprofits and starting some kind of initiative in high school. The thing that I like so much about nonprofits is that there's no excuse. It's not like it's some niche club or varsity sport that you needed three or five years of prior experience in order to succeed in. Anyone can do it, and that's the beauty of it. You, as the CEO or founder, have full creative control over the direction that you take your organization. I wanna keep this video straight to the point. If you watch for the next couple minutes, I want you to be able to walk away from this having working knowledge on how and what kind of idea you want to come up with for your nonprofit, and then exactly how to take it, execute it, build it into something very big and meaningful, scalable, and be able to get the most reward out of your nonprofit, whether it comes to awards, leadership positions, and just general skills that will benefit you when you're working on your college application in the future. Now, let's also not BS around the point that you probably are thinking about doing something like this for your college application. Right? You can lie to everyone else, but between you and me, you don't have to lie here because I've been in your shoes. The question that everyone wants to know the answer to is, will this help my college application? And is it worth the time? The answer to those two questions is yes, absolutely, but it's contingent on a few little points. Most notably, if I don't start the video talking about this mistake that people make, I feel like I'm doing a disservice because it's so important. If you start a club, or nonprofit, or really any activity, 100% for college applications, and 0% because of your actual interest in it, it's bound to fail. The reason for that is because our intrinsic feeling of motivation is extremely faulty. As soon as things get difficult, you face a roadblock in your work, or even more common, school or say some other activities you're involved in that maybe you prioritize a little bit more, as soon as they get busy, you're just going to stop working on the project because you don't really care about it that much. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen people make this mistake of doing something purely for the college application and then just leaving it behind. And all the work that you've put in up till that point, even if it's just 20, 30 hours, is now completely wasted. If you're doing the activity, even just 30% because you actually care about maybe the work that you're doing or the problem that you're attempting to solve, you will have enough of motivation to just be consistent with a nonprofit. And everything I'm about to tell you in this video is contingent on that fact. It's contingent on the point that you don't give up when things get hard. You don't give up as soon as you face a roadblock. Instead, you use the motivation that you have to continue solving whatever good problem you're working on to power forward and to actually make some kind of meaningful change in your community. If you persevere past the L's you will inevitably take on this journey, then eventually you'll get your big break and that's when everything you're about to learn about in this video is going to be worth it. The only way this video is going to work is if I break down my own nonprofit organization, what I did, how I did it, and then explain how you can recreate those same steps in your own work and then go beyond so that you can also find success when you're going through this journey of starting your own initiative with your own idea. I started my nonprofit when I was in 10th grade. The nonprofit is called Solar Vent, and it targets a very niche but widespread global problem. In many parts of Southeast and Southern Asia, as well as large parts of Africa, it's estimated by the World Health Organization that over 2.5 billion people cook using biomass fuels. Things like crop waste, charcoal, and different forms of wood all count as biomass fuels. And the main issue here is that the majority of people who cook using these fuels cook in poorly ventilated indoor kitchens. When the toxic products of burning these biomass fuels are inhaled, it leads to a plethora of different issues in the body, including acute respiratory infections, heart diseases, and lung cancers. Now that's the problem that I identified. It's a problem that I'm passionate about and also something that I've seen firsthand when I'm in India. So what's the solution? The final product that I helped develop uses recycled solar panels as well as desktop PC fans to create a remote, low-cost ventilation system that can be installed in these homes. The idea is that by using recycled solar panels, not only are the costs reduced, but it's also something that's a lot more accessible in these countries because of the way solar panel manufacturers work and the locations that they're in, and it removes the need for batteries, right? These families don't have the access, or the, it's another financial burden for them to have to purchase new cells, and so by using this solution, they're able to remove particles using those recycled PCs 
see fans from their homes, reducing the number of particles they inhale and thus giving them some kind of long relief while cooking. In a nutshell, that is the project that I did, and the final work with the nonprofit involved sourcing all of these different materials, working with another nonprofit organization to build these systems and get them installed in countries, and in the end, we did a couple different programs where we built these solutions, we did some community efforts, we had a bunch of these systems made, and then given to the nonprofit organization who works out of Myanmar to get these installed in the homes of many, many families. I'll tell you right now, people glorify the process of coming up with an idea so much. Like when you look at media, people almost just make it seem like overnight an idea just hits them. I'm telling you right now, I'm gonna break down that entire myth and give you a legitimate workflow that you can use to truly come up with another meaningful idea, something like this that you can implement into your own action. First of all, most people who ever wanna do this nonprofit or initiative work, they get stuck on this idea generation part because it's hard. I get it. It's not something that'll just naturally come to you. And I'll tell you right now, even if you're just sitting there thinking like this all day for months on end, nothing is going to hit you. I had friends who used to just sit like that and think, and it took them literally like months of brainstorming to just come up with nothing. Because the issue here is that you need to be like actively thinking about ideas as you're just kind of going about your everyday life. At least for me, that was the best thing that I could possibly do. What I noticed was that when it comes to this idea generation, people focus way, way, way too much on the actual solution. When the true idea generation needs to come from identifying a problem, you don't have to originate a solution out of thin air. The first step to even being able to be in a position where you can think creatively about solutions is to find problems. You need to start by just changing the way you view the world around you. When you see problems, anything. It can be the smallest problems that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yo, you can't get up consistently for school. You're in the bathroom brushing your teeth and uh, your toothbrush snaps in half. The toilet doesn't work. Like these little problems that you see every single day, you're sitting at your bus stop and you notice the bus driver has like a, a ankle or wrist cramp from gripping the steering wheel. Like all these little things, just keep them in your mind. I'm telling you, in every single person's lives, there are problems that you see that you're so used to seeing, you just dismiss. You don't even give a chance to think about them and the fact that from there, you could potentially come up with an idea. The reason I'm even saying this so confidently is because recently I've started doing consulting calls with you guys, right? With other high school students who are interested in getting the top tier colleges. By the way, if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one consulting with me, you can email me at prateek.self.improvement at gmail.com. Quick plug. But the truth is, I've been working with these students and a lot of them get stuck in this exact same place, right? What idea do I come up with, Prateek? Within 20 to 30 minutes of reading the resume, talking to them, getting to know their interests and hobbies and what they do, I've been able to help them come up with so many different ideas for nonprofits they could potentially go and start, problems that they've seen and they're interested in, but they just needed a little bit of help reframing how you could even potentially do this. I'm telling you right now, identifying problems is the key to finding the solution. Most people can't even get past that first step, which is why they're never able to find success in this. Once you identify problems, start writing them down. For me, what that looked like was I would just write down these types of problems in like my phone notes app. Whenever I'd see something that potentially could be interesting, I just write it down. Then eventually you're gonna have a list of like a couple different things. And then from there, you can start taking the time to think about, okay, how can I tackle these different problems? Now, the next thing we need to talk about is the fact that there are, at least in my eyes, two different directions that you can take a nonprofit organization. The nonprofit that I did was a very like physical hands-on thing, right? I generated an end product that is being used by people. Not all nonprofits have to do that. That's just one type. In my eyes, I feel like there's a second type of nonprofit that's almost a lot easier to do that plenty of high school students find success in. And it's selling some kind of like online service or product. And that can be in the form of advocacy, creating some kind of podcast, newsletter, community sessions, something along those lines. Typically, it can be something that benefits with working with people like mental health or advocating for some kind of problem. Maybe it's like natural disasters for people in like, you know, Haiti or uh, other things that are ongoing in the world. That's an entirely different pathway of a nonprofit that you definitely want to keep your mind open to because it's something that even if you don't have the skills for doing like exceptional coding or you don't have the hands-on work that you feel to be able to do something like physical, pretty much anyone can start like a, a mental health advocacy campaign type nonprofit that's still going to be work, but it's also going to get you 
very similar rewards in the end. You can do a lot of cool stuff with that as well. So at this point, we've talked about coming up with an idea, right? Identifying that problem first, and then understanding that there's a couple different pathways of nonprofits that you can go down. You can also go online and do a little more research. But from here, okay, Prithik, I've done a little bit of research. I have a couple ideas, seeds. What do I do from here? This part is something that you definitely want to account for because it's a little different than the rest of your college application. You actually have the luxury of being able to work with other people on this nonprofit organization. And I strongly recommend that you do for a lot of other things that you work on, right? Your grades, your SAT score, your extracurriculars, where you're maybe playing a sport or playing the piano or whatever it is. You have to do all those things entirely by yourself. This is one of the only parts of your college application where you can benefit tremendously from just working with a couple other people. It can be your close friends. It can literally be people you don't even know that you just met online that share a similar passion around a certain topic. Working with other people will not take away from your credibility. A lot, just because you say that you're a co-founder as opposed to a founder, you're not gonna get rejected by colleges. But the benefit that you gain from having more perspectives, people with different skill sets and talents than you, other ideas being added to your projects and just generally people to distribute your work to or amongst that will really help you take your nonprofit to the next level. For me personally working on my nonprofit, I worked on it with one other friend. The two of us were like a very strong dynamic duo. We covered all of our bases and different skill sets. We had a very similar direction and we complemented each other. So that was enough for me. I'd say that if you work in a group of somewhere between two to five people, that's probably the sweet spot. I really don't recommend going bigger than that when you start because let's face it, like when you're in a high school, there's a lot of other complications that start to come into play. Some people feel like it's the best course of action to just start off by making like this massive organization or even worse, like founding a club using your nonprofit and then just recruiting a bunch of members. And now you have like 30 different people you know in this club but you run into an issue very, very quickly. You have no clue what you're actually going to do with this nonprofit. You haven't taken the time to plan it. You've just done a bunch of outreach and gotten a bunch of people involved when you're at the helm and you don't know where you're going to steer the ship. I also need to bring up like the practical considerations of doing something like this in high school. Realistically, this is probably the first time you're doing anything really related to business. Your entire perception of what business is, is just influenced by what you've heard from like your parents and friends and what you see in movies, which is just not the reality of it, right? If you just get a bunch of people together and you don't have a direction, there's gonna be like ego issues and like people just picking out different leadership positions. You're gonna, I'm telling you right now, you're gonna spend the first like three weeks of working with these people, just trying to decide who gets what leadership position and like what the name of your club is gonna be. Nobody cares about that when you're starting. What you want to do when you're first getting started is come up with an actual feasible business plan. You need to figure out what your problem is, what your potential solution is, and then start breaking down literally every single component of that to try to figure out if it's even a practical reality. When you have a small group of people, that makes it much more feasible to do. We're gonna talk about making a business plan like in a second, but first we need to talk about this term nonprofit that's been thrown around a lot in this video, almost kind of loosely. The way we're defining a nonprofit is not like the Google or official definition of what a nonprofit is. As a high schooler, you are not expected to pay thousands of dollars and file for a 501c3 nonprofit official organization. You do not have to do that and I actually advise against doing it. The whole point of becoming a 501c3 organization is because there are tax benefits, financial benefits, you can get grants more easily, and in general, your organization will just be viewed as like a more trustworthy and official source. However, in the context of high school college admissions, you have to continue to ask yourselves these important questions. How much does it matter for all of these things? And can I get the same benefits by doing something a little bit easier? The truth is that technicalities don't really matter. You're far better off spending those several months you'd be working on filing for like nonprofit status, working to just figure out exactly what your nonprofit is going to do and how you're going to do it. There's also other issues that I should just let you know before you start doing some, anything like crazy with this, if you decide to try to go file. In a lot of states, there's like actual laws surrounding how a nonprofit that's officially filed needs to be run. For example, in California, you need a minimum of six people 
to even found a nonprofit, you need like three people who kind of act as like the, the founder, CEO, board of directors, as well as a bunch of another three people to like manage the money, act as like treasurer and CFO and stuff like that. It's kind of complicated and you don't really get much of a benefit for listing that as one of the things that's in your nonprofit. Colleges care so much more about the work that you're actually doing and what you were able to contribute to that than whether you're able to fill out some paperwork correctly. Now, regardless of that, you'll likely reach a point in your nonprofit where you might want some money to work with. And I'll be honest, fundraising is hard. It's if you just go around like in your community, just asking people for money, there's only so much you can ask from everyone and you're gonna cap out at some amount based on where you're living, right? You can't just expect to get tens of thousands of dollars, which is why there's other things and other players here that you should definitely consider. This is where you can look into what's called fiscal sponsorships. Effectively, this is when like a larger nonprofit organization can basically take the work in that you're doing as like a sub project so you can get the same benefits. They might even provide you with some funding or some advisors and generally they'll even give you like full control over being able to do what you want. They'll just give a couple inputs here and there, but you can get a bunch of the benefits that a nonprofit has without having to actually personally file for the work that you're doing as your own independent nonprofit. So if you're going to tackle an idea that actually needs like capital and like money and resources to get started, well then try reaching out to some of these other bigger businesses. And a lot of times they're super helpful. They'll be willing to help you. Once you have your idea, your team, and some level of basis for what you're trying to do, you need a plan, an effective business plan. Now, I also need to be clear about the, the limitations of my advice. I am not a business savant. I grew up in high school primarily doing scientific research. That's my area of expertise. But in whatever experiences I have had running a nonprofit, this is basically the workflow that I followed to see some level of success. What you want to do is you want to break down your problem, figure out your exact target audience, as well as your solution and all the different components of it. So in the context of my work, what that looked like was after we established exactly what the problem was and how we wanted to try to go about fixing it using solar panels and these desktop computer fans, me and my business partner, my, or my friend who was working on this project with me, we started digging deeper and deeper into each of these components and trying to figure out how we can source them, how we can put them together. Every detail that you can kind of think about, start planning it out and seeing if you can figure out ways to do it. From here, the next thing we were doing in parallel while we were planning this is a ton of outreach. I can't even like, express how many cold emails we sent out to different organizations. When it came to trying to find recycled like PC fans, we emailed so many many local electronic recycling companies and eventually we got people to respond to us. There were people who were willing to donate us these spare parts basically for free, if not for almost like a super minimum cost. People are willing to help high school students who are just there to ask it, right? Reach out to a ton of people. We did the same thing for trying to source solar panels and we went even bigger for that. Not only did we contact companies like Solar World to try to like work with them, those things never really worked out. But what did work out was we reached out to some guy like in China. Uh, who's like worked in like a solar panel manufacturing company and we were able to even like get on calls with him talking about sourcing it work on like pricing that worked for us I mean you can do all kinds of cool stuff if you just push yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone plan everything when you're doing this process you're going to reach like roadblocks and you're gonna have to make compromises the original vision that you have for your product is not it like 100% of the time, it's not going to be exactly what the final outcome is. Some things you'll find out there, it's way too expensive to add like, you know, a bunch of different switches in the, the system, or you're not gonna be able to work on like this kind of, uh, you know, you're thinking of doing some kind of podcast with these people, but it's way too much work to try to get them to schedule into your time frame and your time schedule, right? You're going to run into these things, work around them, right? That's why you work with a team on these things. Everyone has new ideas and things that they can contribute towards coming up with eventually a final reasonable solution. Outreach beyond just like component and like, like business outreach is also super important. Who you wanna be trying to talk to are other nonprofits. Typically, they'll be like official, these ones are official 501c3 nonprofits that work in the similar field as you. You can reach out to them asking about the work that they're doing, asking if there's like some representative that maybe you could get on like a call with and talk to. And what you wanna do with these things is learn as much as you can. You wanna learn about the industry, the field, what kind of projects that they're working on, and you wanna to try to use that knowledge towards furthering your own product. Another thing to also think about is that when you reach out to these organizations, 
you now have contacts here, right? These are people that you're getting more and more familiar with. Maybe they talk to you and they, you know, they kind of like you and the work that you're doing. In the future, you might wanna pair up with these people. You might wanna use them as like a business partner to do something. Now you're opening doors by reaching out. This was something that was huge for me during like the outreach that me and my friend did. We reached out to one organization in particular called Myanmar Hope, who works on developing similar type, not the exact same type of project that we were doing, but other very helpful projects in Myanmar as like a Christian mission. They build like schools and wells and things like that. We just reached out to them just like out of nowhere, just kind of trying to talk to them and learn what they were doing and how they were working and things like that. And eventually we ended up partnering up with them and using them as like a connection to go and install our solutions in Myanmar. That was huge for us. And that just stemmed from doing that initial outreach. Not only do you want to just reach out to organizations, but you can also feel free to reach out to people in your community. I keep stressing this in the video because it's so important and not enough people do it. Adults are willing to help you. If you know someone, some adult in your area who's working in a similar field, or you think they might have knowledge on a certain topic that's related to your nonprofit you're working on, go and email them, talk to them, get on a Zoom call with them. People are accessible nowadays to just do a 15 minute chat and give you a little bit of advice or point you to another person who might be able to help you. Those contact calls are massive. You'd be surprised how many people know things that you didn't even expect them to know. The next thing to talk about is marketing. This is something that like eventually we had to discuss, but it's not something that I like to talk about earlier because I feel like, at least in my mind, the way I perceive it, it's almost like a little bit corny to me because it's the marketing side of things is like, it's almost so like over used like in media that people focus on this way too much when they're starting off a business or a nonprofit. The goal here when you're starting off like whatever you're doing your idea is to figure out what you're doing and do a really good job on the actual like plan for how you're going to try to implement it, make it a reality and working through all those different kinks. Coming up with like your name and your branding is not something you need to start off by doing. And the reason I kind of cringe a little bit at it is because that's the exact mistake that I made when I was starting off. I was literally like sitting there wasting so much time just thinking about like, oh, like what should like the name be or like the color scheme of the branding or how do I want to mark? Like you don't need to think about it that deep, okay? The name of my nonprofit is Solar Vent right? Like solar ventilation, very straightforward, kind of explains like what I'm doing. When my like friend told me that name, he was like, yo, we should go with something like this. I was kind of like cringing a little bit inside because I'm like a naturally a little bit more creative person. I wanted to do something kind of clever, something like cool and slick. At the time, I didn't realize that you don't need to do any of that. Like you're just wasting your effort. If you're going to scale something into like a, a five figure business or a nonprofit, it's extremely successful. Through that journey, you'll have other people come on board, right? Other adults, people with different experiences and strengths and things like branding. They'll help you work through that process and make it work in the end. Have a little bit of faith in that. Come up with some like decent like name and branding scheme or whatever to just work with at the start and then figure it out as you go. It's really not the most important thing that you want to be burning your calories on. Now, in context of college admissions, what things do we want to do when we're putting together our nonprofit and working through it to really maximize the reward that we get out of it? I really recommend you go start looking into business competitions. Just go onto Google and look up like business competitions for high school students. You'll find a bunch of different things that you can apply to. About two to three months into working on your nonprofit, you have some things going, you've been working with different adults or different companies, you're, you're doing things, right? That's about the time that you wanna start applying to these business competitions because now you're working on it in parallel and everything kind of just falls into place because now you have like new deadlines to work towards. I find that when you're starting something fully on your own and you're for the really the first time in your life, your own boss, it can be kind of hard to work on like a timetable because you don't know what to expect or what your goals are by each stage. But when you start getting involved in these competitions and you have deadlines now, like, oh shoot, by July 1st, I need to have this much work completed or I need to get this new project out so that I can market it when I go to this conference and I start talking about my work or when I submit this, this research report or when I submit this marketing video to them. That's the goal here is that these business competitions will drive you to continue to do work. But when you also apply to them and you show up and you talk about everything that you're doing, along the way, you'll pick up some awards. Like if you shoot your shot in enough different places, something is going to click. It'll help you get some connections. Maybe they'll give you a thousand dollars worth of grant money to continue doing what you're doing. There's a ton of different perks to it. And eventually you put all of this onto your college application. You'd be surprised at how many places you can win different awards if you're doing the right kind of work. 
and eventually it'll all just kind of come full circle on each other, right? That season of doing a bunch of different competitions will end. And now your nonprofit has come so much further while also getting a bunch of different awards along the way. Another tip that I can't stress enough, make sure you document your journey. Okay, this is huge because eventually you're going to want this stuff. Take screenshots of emails, right? Big emails, some new deal came through, screenshot it. You guys are working on some kind of project or you have some kind of community get together, take a ton of pictures. Maybe even make that someone's role for one person out of like your team to just show up to these events and just take a bunch of pictures, videos, little like interview snippets with people, all of these things will come into use for you later. It's literally a couple minutes of work that will save you weeks of headache later on when you're looking back six months later and you're doing some kind of business competition or you just wanted this to put together some kind of uh, write-up or report and you're sitting there scratching your head like, yo, there's no way I put in like a month of planning to do this community event and I barely even took like any photos or, or evidence or write-ups of what actually happened there. You're really, really going to want all of these documents later on in the future, so make sure you keep that up. Just make sure you remember that setbacks and occasionally feeling lost are entirely part of this journey, okay? It's not some weird feeling, it's a feeling that everybody experiences, but your ability to succeed is entirely defined by how well you take those things as they come into your life and you use them as a way to grow and you stay confident in the work that you're doing. I've given you a ton of information to chew down in this video and I know it's going to be a lot, but don't get too overwhelmed with it. The first step from here is simple. You don't even have to worry about any of the later things I said in the video. You can rewatch the first five minutes where I talk about how to come up with the idea, how to identify the problems. That's all you have to do right now is just in your everyday life, when you wake up in the morning, when you're going through your day, start looking around your community for problems that you could potentially identify. Start thinking about things that you're interested in. That's where you wanna focus your efforts on now, and then you'll build your nonprofit up and up and up into something beautiful in the future. All right, thank you all so much for watching. If you have any other questions, feel free to let me know in the comments or just shoot me an email. This has been Pratik, peace.